I got an error. <laughs> no. Oh, no, 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 no. That was just a recording error. We are streaming. Oh. Oh, uh, okay. Hey, no. Yeah, I, I saw it go live for streaming. <laughs> okay. Live for streaming. We are. We are streaming. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. We are doing it. All right. Yeah. Hello, mad chatters, <laughs> all of you patient folks out there. <laughs> welcome, Hello. welcome. Uh, Hello. We have gone through an incredibly fun afternoon to, uh, we have moved <laughs> heaven and earth to make this stream happen because we have the Anna B. Meyer on with us tonight. Okay. Um, <laughs> They can't see you yet, Anna. They can only hear you. Okay, um, hello. <laughs> uh, making sure audio sound good to everybody. If somebody in the in the uh, chat can just let us know, uh, you can hear all of us. If yes. All right. All right. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's always that. <gasps> yeah. I did my job. So, uh, so we'll, we'll talk about uh, tonight and uh, what we've got coming. We'll be on for a little more than an hour. We'll push this as close up to Jay's stream uh, as we can to get the most time that we can with Anna uh, tonight because we were supposed to start at 5.30. Uh, you can hear Vivi. Pat, Pat, I don't need that right now. Uh, we, <laughs> we, we had an echo on our stream last night. Uh, Vivi's like w was echoing. So you can always, try, like when you're trying to troubleshoot something, you can trust Pat Draws to actually yeah, make mm -hmm. it worse. And, and yeah, uh, to mark it really heavily. <laughs> Exactly. exactly. Like, he's gonna, yeah. Jay has a lot of guests today, so he doesn't need me for a while. So yeah, I see. he's got a, he's got Eric yeah. Mona on with him too, and that's going to be a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why don't we show our beautiful faces, John? All right, let's go. We'll show the beautiful faces and mine. And yes. oh, hush. And we're live. Everyone, everyone. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to Blue Box Lore Masters Arcanum. A little bit different format tonight, and we'll explain why in a moment. Uh, but I want to thank you for being with us, and uh, we have some amazing guests with us tonight. You've met all of these folks in some way or another here on Blue Box, uh, so there's familiar faces, uh, but some of these folks have never met each other. And so I'm really excited about the topic that we have tonight. I'm also excited about the guests that we have. Uh, first of all, let me apologize to all of our mad chat that were a few minutes late. You know, we did want to kick off at 5.30 tonight. Uh, unfortunately, here at Blue Box Central, we lost power about an hour and 40 minutes ago, right in the middle of my work call, actually. And it didn't uh, come back until... Uh, I had already panicked, reached out to Thomas and Robert, and they both helped put together uh, this kind of uh, hastily uh, constructed setup so we could get everybody on today. And then, of course, as these things happen, my power came back five minutes later, but it was too late because you know I could not have possibly gotten everything set up in time for the stream. So, again, thank you for your patience, and we will run everything tonight. The last thing I'm going to do, Thomas, uh, that's going to put a little more stress on you is I'm going to ask Anna. You sent me an email with those two sets of files. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas will have to be the one to do any sharing tonight. So uh, if you could send those two emails to him as well. Uh, so as we're uh, sort of going through our discussion, I'll he can be my... in the chat. That way I don't give everyone on the internet Perfect. my personal email address. Yep. <laughs> That's a wise idea. Our faces are going to look weird say, for half a second. That's fair. Everything. That's fair. Yeah, exactly. All right. So uh, let's go around. Let's quickly do some introductions. And uh, rather than me introduce each of you, I'd like to each of you uh, just give a quick introduction of yourselves. We'll work our way around and we'll close off with Anna, uh, who is our special guest tonight. And let's start with you, Rachel. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi. Oh, my goodness. I'm Rachel. That is my name. Born <laughs> given. Uh, I <laughs> I play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. It is a wonderful game, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, perhaps too much, if there is any <laughs> of that. Um, I met Thomas, who then introduced me to all of these lovely people. And I am incredibly excited to be a part of this. Uh, I'm in college for psychology. Ooh. That's fun. Fun facts. <laughs> um, I have three cats. They're all really great. Um, yeah. All right, that's good. That's good. Yeah, it's, it's not a dating profile, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> an introduction on a street uh, uh, but no and so uh, and both Rachel and the next uh, person we'll introduce here uh, Cameron they are going to be players in the brand new Sunday stream uh, which will be replacing room Lords because we concluded that campaign after three years thank and goodness that will be that will be so cool because it will be uh, a crossover really between uh, uh, the the uh, aired world of troll Lord games that will be the the world that we'll be in 
but we're using all the brand new content for the City of Altamira box set, which is not even out yet. The City of Altamira and that region living in both Aird and Greyhawk, a collaboration between Lord Gazumba and our friends at Troll Lord Games. And so I could not resist the opportunity to be the first one to put a live stream campaign up using the city of Altamira in the world of Aird. And uh, these two uh, young ladies will be two of the four players that will be playing with us on Sundays. And that will be, be uh, debuting here in about three and a half weeks. Uh, so Rachel, thank you for being with us. Cameron, go ahead. Hi, I'm Cameron. I'm just playing Cameron here in Discord and over on Instagram. Uh, I don't do much on either one of those things, but I'm there regardless. Um, I'm in graduate school right now, studying to hopefully integrate clinical mental health counseling and tabletop gaming in some way. Uh, but yeah, that's that's it. I'm currently trapped in a room with COVID. And that's <laughs> all I got going <laughs> <laughs> well, frankly, it's the only reason that we were able to have her tonight because she was supposed to be on a trip and uh, because yeah. she couldn't go. Um, but you, you, you sound great. You look great. Are you feeling okay? I feel great. Um, I mean, everything's uphill after here. I did get it on my birthday, uh, oh. so really, everything oh. can Just only hit go after up from here. It so uh, keeps coming. <laughs> one big uh, old dunk. Uh, but yeah. we're having a great day today. Yeah. Well, and I, I want to uh, tell you also, Annie, you'll appreciate this. Both of these young ladies have incredibly well thought out, detailed, multi-page backstories with such rich like text for a DM to sink his teeth into and create great stories. Um, they're they're just I'm so excited already to be pardon, playing with them. Pardon me. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's just, am I chopped Thomas. liver? Uh, Sorry. Thomas, um, after reading theirs, I actually did want to talk to you about yeah, yours, yeah. so we can do that <laughs> off screen. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna, yeah, I'll go, guys. It's all right. No, Thomas. <laughs> um, we'll forego uh, the full introductions. Uh, everybody here knows Thomas. Uh, Thomas, of course, plays Alcott Divero, Wizard Extraordinaire, also runs Monster of the Week, does Yeoman's work with that. We're hoping to have at least one of those in the month of August as well. Okay. Um, and then uh, he is doing all of our tech support tonight. Thank you so much, Thomas. And then Robert, Phantom NJ, you know, uh, patron of the community, beloved by all in Grey Hawkery, big uh, blue box contributor, number one on our Discord. It's not even close. Um, everyone else is trailing in his dust. Also runs Friday Night Crusades um, on our Discord and is an admin here for us. And Robert, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, the last introduction that we'll do, and I really wanted to do this because I was as excited about the content I was tonight, I was honestly more excited about introducing Anna to Cameron and Rachel. Uh, and they were also excited as well. So Anna, uh, tell, uh, our audience knows you, but tell uh, these two young ladies a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a fantasy cartographer. I've been playing D&D &D and role-playing games for a bit over 40 years. And, and I've been mapping for well over 20 and, and as a serious hobby. And I mean serious, meaning spend lots of hours learning and, and tweaking it and professionally a bit over 10 years. So, so and I've published maps for about a dozen game publishers now over the, the last decade. And I run a patron and, and thankfully hundreds of people are paying me money every month so I can do this and professionally and, and it's a lot of fun. That's yeah, incredible. and 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 she was so humble uh, in the way she said that. Uh, she is renowned and beloved. Uh, she is an icon uh, among our communities and uh, she is also uh, just a, a really, really good person to be around. She's with Jay almost every week on his streams and contributes yep. uh, all kinds of knowledge. So tonight uh, I wanted to start off before we get to session zero characters or level zero characters, which is gonna be the, the bulk of our discussion tonight. I really wanted Anna to share uh, with the two of you, but also with uh, our Blue Box audience, because you know, we do have a lot of crossover with Jay, but it's not all crossover. We each have some unique viewers. And so I wanted to expose um, everyone on the Blue Box channel uh, to what Anna does. So uh, Thomas is pulling up uh, some of the images here in just a moment. But Anna, why don't you just start wherever you'd like to in terms of maybe we start with the cartography and then maybe we could talk about the heraldry, if that would be all right with you. Sure. And yeah. Uh, just explain to us like what this means, like how you got into it, how you do it. It's just, it's fascinating. And whatever you'd like to share, it would be great. Well, I, I started, I simply, it, it started with me wanting to, to map my own, for my own campaign. Like so many other DMs, you, you scribble down notes and, and then you take, you do maps and stuff. And then, then I just saw first at work in the military, I saw these kind of cool computer generated maps 
that was awesome. And this is back in the early mid eighties to early to mid eighties. I saw these kind of cool computer generated uh, using LIDAR, LIDAR, radar and all sorts of satellite technology. And I was like, I want that for my games. And, and I was like, and I thought it was just a pipe dream back then, but I, I still had that kind of vision what I wanted. And then in the 96 or 95, I think it was by 95. Then I saw in a computer magazine, I saw an ad for a software called Bryce that could do terrain like that. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. I want that. And 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 there was one, it was only for Apple. So, so I that, there was one store in Stockholm that sold Apple and Mac. So I just ran over there and said, these specs, what do you want it? And they will cost the equivalent of, what is it, like 12,000 bucks or something like that. Right, and I was right. like, I was almost holding up my credit card by it then and there that day, so to speak. But I was smart enough to realize that hmm, I wanted Windows. I don't, so so I actually managed to get a hold of the company. I worked in Intel after all, so, and they were based in Seattle. So I made a call to them and asked like, can I get that to my Windows computer? And I said, no, no, hold off. And I said, do I need to buy a Mac? And they said, no, no, we're working on a Windows edition. It's coming out next year. So I held off and, and then I bought the beefiest Windows computer you money could buy. It cost like eight, nine thousand bucks or something. And I installed <laughs> it and I started learning. And it was a tough curve to get it. It took me a couple of years to get something, probably two thousand hours or so to 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 through three years to get something that I started to realize, damn, I have the vision. That's what I want it to look like. And then I just started working on it. And then I put a website up two thousand three or something like that. And a few people found it and it just took off from there. And then I, I kept that up as a hobby until I moved to California in 2011. And that's when I started doing it full time. So I, I didn't realize you'd been doing this full time for 11 years now. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. Wow. Well, the first it was not really a job. It was just that I need to finish the damn Greyhawk map because I didn't have a job <laughs> here. So I just like took the chance to, to simply, now I have the time. So I didn't look for a job. I just sat down and did it. And then Wolfgang Bauer from Cobalt Press and a bunch of others reached out and said, oh, can you do maps for us? And it kind of gradually took off. Patron came around and now I have a, a not much, but I have a small but steady income. And, and that's what it takes. That has to make you one of the most tenured people in the industry doing this, right? Like 11 I, years of, of map making, right? I, there, there are others who've done it as least as long as I have. They, they've been painting maps for and, and stuff for a long time. And, and yeah. I think that's part of cartography is tedious, painstaking, and, and, and it's not, it, it, it's, if you do regular art, you can be passionate and you can work on a piece like this, but this is ongoing projects forever, so to speak. You're never done with it. And now when I've done the Greyhawk map, what I do, I start all over again to do it in a better detail. So, so this will never, I might be able to do it one more time properly before I die. So I have to retire. So, so that's what I'm, I'm hoping to do. So in the next 20 years, I hope to do, do it all over again, a thousand times better than the previous <laughs> existing one. That, that's my goal. Well, that's, that's, that's fantastic, Anna. Thank you. And while you're talking right now, Thomas is showing images of all of your maps and uh, yes. all the content Incredible. you've done. Is there anything Bonkers. in particular uh, you, you would like to make sure he shows? I've got the Flaness up right now. Yeah, yeah. You could, you could, we can talk about the existing big map that, that shows right now. That one is basically used, I, I used uh, Bryce at, at Bryce 3D from DAS software. It came out in 97. I used the version that uh, 5.1 or something like that that was came out in 2000 and I kept using it up until 2010 because I wanted to keep the same consistent look throughout the whole project and then then I used Photoshop and Illustrator Photoshop to touch up things put the little tiny bits together and paint over the ugly bits in Photoshop and then I used Illustrator to create the heraldry the put all the symbols the roads and all that together and and then when I wanted to add Hepona land, I realized that now I'm, I have 20 years of Photoshop experience. I can probably wing it and just create Hepona <laughs> land from scratch. So yeah. I tested my Photoshop 
equivalent. And the Hipmona land expansion is about half the size of, of the current map. It took me five months to do instead of five years, and oh, it was wow. Photoshop only. So so that was wow. me getting better tools, better computers, and have 20 years of, of knowledge and skill now. So so I know way more than I did because I didn't I knew nothing of Photoshop or computer graphics when I started this. So, okay. oh, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead, Robert. Yeah, I was going to say, so uh, the question I have is, at what point did you decide that you were going to wanted to put this into Atlas form? How did how did that come about? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. At first, it was it was Atlas four because the computers were so limited, and we also had to realize that was be back in when I the, my vision and my additional plan was from mid nineties. The internet, the the, the world wide web was barely more than invented. The, there was no browsing back then. It was early early days, meaning net Netscape for people that are old enough mm -hmm. to remember that was barely born as a company. And, and and so there was no World Wide Web to publish. PDF publishing was not invented, meaning digital publishing was not invented. So I thought people had to, of course, download PDFs and then print them and then put them together and bind it. That was the only thing. That was one of the reasons. The other reason was that the computers were so minuscule in power that you can only work on tiny bits at a time. So I right. worked on one page after the other. And then yeah. I decided, and I did that up until 2010. Then I realized that now the computing power is big enough. It will be, so I merged all into one and one big map. Yes. So, uh, kind, of, kind of an adjunct to that, and, and by the way, yeah. uh, thank you everyone that's in the chat. We appreciate all the chat, uh, and hello to everyone. And we did we did get the questions from Shrappies. Anyone that's wondering, we're talking about level zero tonight, uh, which also would include session zero, oh. um, and then we're we're beginning tonight with the incredible work of Anna B. Meyer, uh, fantasy cartography and fantasy heraldry. Uh, the actual session zero for the campaign that we're discussing tonight, which is called The Tears of Aired, uh, will be on uh, September 4th at 1.30 Central Time. And you can see more about that on our Instagram or on our Discord. Uh, Anna, back to Robert's yeah. uh, question. One of the things that's fascinating to me about your work is that it is, it is true cartography in the sense of the topology of the maps, the way the elevations are constructed, and even uh, I've been on conversations with you about natural flows of rivers. And they, how did you, what sort of research did you do to get yourself to the point where you knew how to design the natural flow of a river or to map out the natural elevation topology on, a, on, a, on an atlas? I did what a lot of gamers, uh, good gamers and creators in this field do. You, you, you take your other passions and bring them into your games. And I have a number of passions. One of them is that I'm, I'm, I'm used to be a pilot, an avid lover of, of flying. So I've seen the world from above. So I know what it looks like in the real world. I'm also an avid hiker and, and wilderness person to uh, go out and do landscape photography and stuff. So I've been out in nature and that have, and then I've tried to add to it being a hobby geologist, so to speak, to understand how the earth, earth works and, and stuff like that. And biology, I, I love bird watching, taking pictures of, of wild animals and, and especially birds and stuff out in nature. So I tried to combine all these interests and start thinking, okay, if I take all this knowledge and then try to apply it to a fantasy world where, where magic is real, demons exist and and, and, and and the gods do power and, 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 and dragons fly around and, and, and things burrow underground and stuff like that so i tried to figure out what would that place look like and and meaning we have all the stories we know what the monsters look like and stuff for me it's like i want to figure out what kind what would the world look like on a large scale to make those stories happen so to speak that that's my perspective in my cartography so 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 i tried to take that approach meaning what world would create these stories and then visualize it we see hollywood does it to some degree but they only do it scene by scene i'm trying to puzzle together all these scenes into the large landscape, so to speak. And I want to expand that to what would the outer planes look like and other planes, meaning right. map the abyss and, and the Feywild <laughs> and stuff. That's what I'm thinking about right now, making figure oh. out what technology do I need, what skills do I need, what oh. other kind of cool th features, what, what happens to water in those worlds, meaning do water always, meaning the river sticks. I would love to, to map the river sticks. So I'm, these oh. are the, the problems I'm tackling right now. 
thinking that <laughs> I want to move into these things. And it, it, ranging from what you do to the passions you have and the flight and the high, like, yeah. it, it really makes me wonder like, what am I doing with my life? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Like just, you, uh, you, you know, they, they, you're doing too much, so much. <laughs> All right, so so I really want uh, uh, the two young ladies here to be able to interact and ask a few questions. Otherwise, uh, uh, we three uh, geeks are going to dominate this conversation because I know Thomas, Robert, and I can do that. So, uh, Rachel, Cameron, anything at all? Like it could be about her life, about um, you, uh, you know her technology, her mapping, her passions. Anything you guys would like to ask her? Um, I think at first I just want to say like one your passion for this is so like deeply contagious like getting Thank to watch you. your face as you were speaking is like i feel like a live wire right now like <laughs> i am so excited and i think like this interaction right now to me is one of my favorite things about hobbies in general uh is like especially like D and tabletop gaming is there is a micro level connection that happens between the people who are playing at the table but then there is also this macro level connection that can be generational. Uh, like you were saying dates that were before I was born when you were talking <laughs> about when you're getting into this. And I know that that could be something that could lead to like separation between us of like, oh, well, that's just too far off. But like, to me, that is so amazing to know that there are people who have been in this community before I have been who are making a space for me one day way down the road. So thank you for creating such a wonderful space for future generations to come. Well, thank you. And, and, and I think that's so cool. Man. And to me, it's like now we're living in the perfect of times. A lot of people, they, they wish they were back in their teenage years and stuff. It's like, no, my, the best time is now, meaning the world yeah. has, has now turned into something. I like it more, at least in the field of role playing games and my passions and stuff. Oh, it's, no, it's, it's so it's, true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we, we, we've talked about that, uh, Robert and Thomas, like, when you grew up in the you know 70s and 80s the number of miniatures materials terrain but yeah, you, yeah. it was it was nothing compared to what we have mm -hmm. today the stuff yeah. that i have behind me here was unimaginable at that I time i mean tailspire yeah. period yeah. like even yeah. that yeah yeah <laughs> well, i mean you can i i mean my 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 hobby store didn't even carry miniatures it would you know they they might have had a few somewhere around but and besides that as a kid i could afford the books I could buy the books, or I could have the miniatures. Yeah. yeah. Going very far without the books. Yeah. <laughs> I think the one benefit of having grown up before all this became accessible, so to speak, and affordable, was that you got a journey. I think I was born in that sense at the perfect time, meaning I had, mm. I'm born 1965. So, so I, so I had like, my, my teenage years and stuff, I was not exposed to this at all. And then it came mm. in, I started first encounter with fantasy and gaming was when I was 15. And then then it gave me the yearning and and to really get into it. And then computers came around of age in the 90s, really, yeah. and stuff. And then I had like, I wanted it, I wanted it, I wanted it so bad. So when it came, I became passionate about it. So, so and then I kind of kept it up and the world have kind of proven me more and more right by more and more people popping up that shares the yeah. same interest. People in my generation, there are a few crazy ones like John and me and, and Jay and others, but we were far between and we didn't know each other because there were no internet and, and it was hard yeah. to get to know each other. Today, you can, I can sense that if, if I grown up today, I would have a million passions and I didn't know which one to concentrate on. But for yeah. me, it was easy. You had, and I had a difficulty because I already have 10 passions. But the, the yeah. good thing is that you had more time back then in a way that yeah. you do now. Yeah. That's fantastic. I also think too, one thing that you touched on and then I'll throw it over to Rachel, is the integration of like your various passions into this. Yes. I, yes. Yeah. I think that's one of my like, favorite things is watching like uh friends that i've met like seeing uh it's as though you've almost scattered like wildflower seeds over a character or over something that you've done and you watch these little like bits poke out of a character that they've created or a world that they've created of like oh i see that you're really interested in that um <laughs> and so hearing your like fascination for like uh seeing the world from above and your uh, passion for hiking and stuff like that and how that has all integrated here is so cool. It's just yeah, really I think that's something we should all do. Oh, sorry, go on. 
So yeah. I was gonna say the exact same thing. Like I found yeah. it so cool that you were able to take all of these passions that you have and loves for all these different parts of the world and then put it together into something that you can work off of not like work off of but work on and just continue mm -hmm. to it's just that's incredible i yeah. love that so much <laughs> i feel oh. like i'm like full fangirl right now like i don't even have <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> well everybody knows girl gamers rock um yeah, for so sure. <laughs> Any any other uh, questions that you had, Rachel, before we move on to I some other topics? Go ahead. I was curious, you've done this for so long. Has there been, I'm assuming like an easy answer would be Greyhawk, but has there been a something that you've worked on that's been your favorite piece that you've created so far? A, a Greyhawk is, is my home piece, so mm -hmm. to speak, and that's my home turf. And and so in a way, it's, it's both a passion, but it's also a test bed because when I work on Greyhawk, I... I do the research anyway. I be practically live in Greyhawk because I, it's kind of I, I, more than most people, so to speak. I get a chance to, to work with this and I've done it for a lot of years. So I know where to look for information. I also have all these wonderful other Greyhawk nerds around me telling me what I do right, what I need to do, what I've done wrong and so on. So I have the best quality assurance team in the world. So, but then so I use Greyhawk as a test bed. And then I also, when I do other commissions, then you have to work on time and on budget much more, so to speak. And people tell yeah. you what they need and what they want. And and it's not up to me that much, so to speak. I'm more like I, I do a job on commission. And that is also cool because you get to confront other stuff and you get to push yourself and, and be effective in a way. And then that effectiveness thinking and the, the efficiency you learn from other projects, especially I have to mention Cobalt Press because those have been the biggest projects I've done. And in yeah. some ways bigger than Greyhawk. A lot of Greyhawk people that live in the Greyhawk community don't realize that I've, I've done more square miles of, of Cobalt, of Midgard than I've done Greyhawk. Huh. And, and But a wow. lot of it has not come out yet so i can't talk much about it but but there are lots and lots there, there are mil a couple of million square miles of midgard wow. maps that no one has seen outside <laughs> of Cobra press yet so 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 there is a bunch of stuff there so to speak and so i bring that kind of efficiency thinking back into greyhawk again but greyhawk is both my home home turf so to speak and my test bed and and in order to so i know i've done all the stupid mistakes on my greyhawk maps first and then i go out and do commissions that's so cool. It's really interesting to me the way that you talk about, like it's your home. Like you, you have this incredible intimacy with a world that a lot of DMs never think about. Like when you look out into our world, it's not there's a building every 50 feet. There's the USA is m mostly forest and desert and landscape yeah. that mm -hmm. DMs tend to just sort of write off as uh, you travel across it. But as a cartographer, you're boring over the, the the details of a random desert in the middle of a uh, mm -hmm. between a marsh and a mountain and yeah i i love that and it's kind of cool because that's my usually my job as especially when you do commissions is that that the the authors of, of modules and source books and adventures of all kind they route write about this the places where the the adventuring happens me as a cartographer is meaning i have this little scene here that little scene there that little cave over there that dragon lair over there that city there and there's like but more than half of it, sometimes 90% of the land is white in between these little dots. So so my job as a cartographer is to figure out what is the in-between. We know that the, the big desert is there and the big jungle is there, but there's like 2,000 square miles or 2,000 miles between the two. What the heck is going from desert to rainforest. It, it's really be, easy it, to write the destinations. Yeah, it's exactly. not as easy to write the journey in between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, so it's that in-between terrain. And that's my advice to cartographers. Your job, primary job, is to put the pieces in the puzzle together, so to speak, to, to figure out the in-between, what goes between that and that spot. Yeah. That's the, the, the expertise yet yeah, you, you need to bring into the, the team when you, especially when you map like large continental and world setting maps that's the expertise you need to figure out because that's what they will demand from you yeah no well said and you know that really goes to something robert talked about uh, on his recent lma talking about exploration and it is those 
areas in between that oftentimes are the fun parts of a campaign. You know, the idea that everything is like fast travel from this city to this city, like a teleportation. Yeah, that can happen, I suppose, at later higher levels when you have a jerk wizard like Alcott. You let but, me take it. You allow it. <laughs> but, but, but that that exploration of the map is is a big part of D and D. That's great. And it's it's game style too. Meaning a, a lot of a lot of game style doesn't need the to know that picture. You just go from scene to scene, and that's it. And and that's a perfectly valid way of playing the game. But when I run campaigns, it's I run simulation style game, games really simulation style but a lot of people they think simulation on a tactical level meaning oh how do combat work and they want to simulate and stuff no it's not that i simulate on a on a larger scale meaning over land movement and stuff so so if you have a bad guy and and you want to, that is going to 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 chase you down over land in the next month or two he's like a 500 miles away and he's trying to find you and and so on that means that you have chases and party might not know about it. the players don't know about it but someone is out there hunting you and i keep track of every hour and every day where you move and where the enemy moves so to speak so so you have on yeah. on that level i do a lot of, of world simulation that doesn't happen in the background and it's for I, me i, I do something like that but it's it's that about four levels higher yep. <laughs> like that's that's yep. So, uh, so when in my uh, campaign, so, when you see ominous clouds and demons and an army gathering at the distance, be worried and run the other way. So, yeah, yeah, so, right. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. That's always good advice. Yeah. And, and I think we're going to talk about some of the simulation style you have, uh, which is, again, uh, conceptually, like, I, I, our styles are so similar, but you are more granular. Like, you really get down to the detail. And when I talked to you about Session Zero stuff and you mentioned yeah, – yeah. I'm going to exaggerate here, but your party spent like four weeks uh, harvesting turnips or something like that. And I, it, was like, yes. it was not that bad, but it was <laughs> it, turnips was the, the, one of the few crops that survived in the village after the Iusian priest taken over and killed off and blighted off most of it. But the turnips, I, I simply rolled and figured out, okay, what survived after five years of Iusian invasion and turnips were the, the ones that popped up <laughs> in my dice. And and so, okay, so they, they, they have to live with whatever. So the in served uh, what they call the table turner that's turnip juice with that <laughs> fermented turnip juice and, and some other stuff so and that's the other thing meaning what do they actually live off so to speak what do yeah. they do to survive and, and stuff like that I always try to and that's being a soldier for decades then then you're always like okay how do you survive so to speak what would you do if yeah. I'm stuck in this village under occupation and things go bad and there's only minimum population and and these evil bastards trying to 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 subdue us so to speak what we do and i try to build that economy that that how the society works so to speak and and i forced my poor players through it for the first like 10 <laughs> 15 sessions or something until they escaped the village yeah that's so, incredible um, go ahead go ahead robert so one, one thing i want to draw attention to and because it's probably my favorite aspect of the map it's a very very gray hawk thing and anna's done so much work on it is i mean and thomas you can stop right like right there um yep. the heraldry the heraldry oh, of the gray hawk map and the fact that it's included because um if you have the old gray hawk folio it has all the heraldry i believe it's on the back cover I yeah so the right. inside of the front and the back of the, cover of the inside yeah. yeah so all the various heraldries and and then there was i think some more of them that you kind of developed as far as like the sub the, uh, instead of like the main areas, like the the smaller parts where mm -hmm. you if you maybe want to speak to the process of how you would figure out what that should look like. Yeah, that, that's an, it was a lot of Greyhawk heraldry is kind of intimately connected. Even TSR said other settings didn't have heraldry because that was a Greyhawk thing. So so we we've been blessed with having good heraldry from the start, so to speak. And we have to remember this is like early '80s, so so a lot of illustration was expensive and and tricky and difficult. So that we got that much heraldry was really like a blessing and and so what i wanted to do was to fill out the gaps I meaning yeah there you have it so so oh. and i love those those were the, some of the biggest thing that caught this me this is right the away. original from the the yeah. 1980 uh, for cameron and rachel 1980 wh whatever year it was too i think or uh, the world of gray hot glossography box set and yeah, wow. so this was oh, what she was just referring to it's the original stack of heraldry but anna there are um yeah i, I added there's like what is like 80 or 90 or something like that most, in the yeah. original yeah and i've added 
I'm up to like 400 now, I think, or something like that. So <laughs> I, I mean, started I'm sitting here with camp. a zip file of 92 that look yeah. real. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That That's the other thing. I, I wanted to upgrade that old kind of rickety looking or, or very basic looking. A lot of it is probably just clip art from the 1980s that they put yeah. in there instead of having, because some of it doesn't look that good, so to speak. Some of it looks really good even even today. But so I wanted to to take a new series and realize now I used Photoshop for 20 years. So let's put that knowledge to 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 good use. Mm -hmm. So I've simply figured out what should, would these shields look like if you saw them on the battlefield. And and so so I started taking some of the latest Photoshop uh, features that came around it a couple of years ago with these kind of cool filters that actually make it look like real, so to speak. So I took that and and I made a couple of tests and it was like, yep, this works. This looks really, really good. So then I took some of my designs and I redone all the existing old shields in that fashion, so to speak. Some of them have changed more than others. And and then when it comes to 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 add more shields, I try to look first I try to look at the existing heraldry, what colors, what type of symbology. And then I try to look at what cultural things do they talk about? Meaning you have old flan culture, meaning that then they tie closer to nature, their old faith religion is Druidism and stuff. So then they clearly, and, and there's a couple of examples. They have one from 10, for instance, that have a rune on the basis of, of gold or, or bronze background. So I realized that metal and, and runes and, and nature stuff is the theme of, of old flan heraldry. So so then I stuck with that with other, so it's cultural more than anything. And ARD, for them, it's like they, they are more kind of for fantasy perspective modern. They want to show off their buildings, their 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 prowess in in fortress, in in commerce, uh, like gold coins and city symbols and and stuff like that. So that that's what they where they they kind of uh, prowess and and want to. So so I stick to that usually. But there is another cool thing with the ARD. They also have colors for the different houses, meaning Rax Nyrond is white and red. And, and, and then you have the Nailex is using blood red and the Crandons using black and the Darmans using green. So I kept that and I mix it up depending on who rules and who used to rule. So if you look at a shield and you see green above yellow, yellow is the old Elissa from Flan days. And then green is Darmans. So you have green above yellow and then a symbol that shows that the, the Darman came here, the ARD house came here and ruled over the Alyssa. We took the terrain, so it's green above yellow. So you can read the history of a place in the heraldry. And 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 so that and then you have also some old ARD stuff, like symbols of dragons and stuff. That's taken from ARD legend that if you read the legends, you can see that in the shields too. God, so, I so love that. That's nerd. the method. So much. I love this. <laughs> that, so that's much. that's the, that's the, the kind of thing you have to kind of read in, so, so you can see you can see a shield and see that's how real medieval heraldry worked in Europe. Yeah. But I I don't go. People say, oh, but Europe rule says this. I said, no, no, Plan East is not Europe. I want by the right. the heraldry have the same function it had back in the day to tell the story to do pr to impress and and to state political domination of something is the sign saying yeah. we own you or we rule here i rule we rule or whatever and and that's and and also to signal on the battlefield or on on a city wall who rules and why and over who and for how long so to speak those are yeah. are the the purpose of heraldry and and they i think will be exactly the same in a fantasy world but the tradition will be different colors that the symbols will be different depending on the culture and stuff like that so just quickly here which is what's so cool about this also is that um she is involved with the uh, box set of Altamira that mm -hmm. she, uh, she's her co-collaborator with Jay. So yep. there is going to be all the cartography done for that. All the heraldry will be done for that. Uh, that's going to be such a cool box set. And I love, this is part of, so what is Lore Masters Arcanum was a question that was in the chat earlier. So here at Blue Box, um, we play D&D &D, and we play D&D &D twice a week, uh, most weeks. And then we have one time a week where we do this talk show. It's Lore Masters Arcanum. Uh, we have different topics and uh, different ideas that we discuss. And tonight we're having a very special conversation with Anna B. Meyer, who is a legend in the field of fantasy cartography and heraldry. And um, what I like about this, you're seeing this is 
I'm geeked up about everything that's happening here. But it's one so of the things cool. I'm geeked up is about the reactions that you get from new players. Um, you know, introducing new players to the depth that this game can have. You can, you, this is, you know, 5e is the gateway drug. <laughs> this is this is the hard crack uh, that we're showing you here. You, <laughs> you, you you get involved with this stuff, and you look, I can I can have a fun role playing game. Just say, hey, you're in a tavern with you know three unruly people, and the the music's playing, and you can have a good time role playing. But when you have this depth behind the the world, and you it, it makes that feeling of simulation and immersion. It's just a whole different level of of involvement and satisfaction. And Anna, we do need to talk about our our yeah. actual topic tonight. But mm -hmm. um, may I just say, I mean, bravo! <laughs> just you. absolutely. Oh my god! So because we started late, um, and because I want to talk to you about this so much more, I'm going to put you on the spot right now and say, would you be willing to come back on at some point in the near future sure. and and, yeah. and go into this a little definitely. bit more? Yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. Um, wow. I, the, the, I mean, the the detail on the shields, I could stare at those things all day long. Yeah. It is gorgeous. <laughs> you, and so you have a key for these uh, that will explain like each shield, um, all the details that you have in the colors, or how will you? Well, I, it, there will be a heraldry compendium that I will put together this fall, so to speak. I'm that, sorry, that... forgive me for my, my, yeah. my banal term, uh, a key, a compendium. Yes, that's what I meant. Of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. That, will be, uh, that, that was the whole plan when I started doing this and I wanted them in high resolution and looking good. So, so the goal is to put together, uh, uh, first I want to have some posters, hopefully that, that Noble Dwarf uh, could print them, have, have them available for print so you can order them there. I hope that will be possible. So we're working on, I'm working on that. So, so, so we'll see if we can get that to happen. And otherwise there will be at least PDFs and stuff. And there will be some, some background text and stuff on them too. So, so explain a little bit where they come from and stuff. The thing will be how to divide them. I think that will first, there will be the original shields from the Greyhawk box set. And then there will be various add-ons, so to speak, so people can get a poster of just those and put it on the wall. But and it will also be since those are originally TSR and now Wizard of Coast property, that's not something I can sell prints of, so to speak. So, but if someone wants to print it, then it's fine, and I don't earn a penny on them. That then it's okay. So, so we'll see what we can arrange. The other stuff is something that I've created. They are my creations. So then we can put them on T-shirts or coffee mugs or whatever we want to to do with them, so to speak. So that's another 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 possibility so we'll see yeah uh fantastic fantastic so um we may have some time to come back to that but i really do also want to discuss yeah. the session zero mm -hmm. and uh so just to explain to everyone as i mentioned we're starting this new campaign uh it will kick off uh in early september and all that information is in our discord it's also on our um, instagram channel and it's going to be based on starting in a session, not just a session zero, but a level zero. I have never started with level zero. I've always started level one. And I played this game for 43 years now, and I've never started at level zero. But I like the concept, and I've heard other people do it. I was talking to Anna last year sometime, and she was describing, I think it was on one of Jay's Gabin shows that I was on. I can't remember exactly what it was and she was running a level zero campaign. And as I heard her describing it, it was clear to me, it was very different than the concept of this that I had seen anywhere else. And so, Anna, I'll just um, maybe let you start off and just give us some of your sort of philosophies and methods on starting a level zero campaign. And then maybe we can take the last bit of the stream here, talk about sort of the high level concept that I have for this new campaign and let all of our various um, panel members here ask questions and just kind of we'll make this more of a fireside chat mm -hmm. okay so the reason that i wanted to go uh, zero level was <clears throat> the same reason that i'm now going classless i want the the story of the game to build the characters that that's the the the, the, cla the concept of class is one of the cornerstones pillars of D, D. but it's the one that i like the least i love how 
almost everything else works in D&D. But I don't like the fact that you have a character that you kind of create outside of the game and then of the story. And then you kind of plot out, say, oh, this character will learn all these things as the game progresses. That has nothing to do with the story because only even, you didn't even know the story. To me, that's something that that has it ties back to the roots of a military war game, strategic war game that that I think it's time, at least in my games, to to abolish that. And and I want a, the the story to evolve. The character should evolve with the story, and and should gain experience, features, and and abilities and stuff that comes from the story. That okay. was this. So I'm, the, that's the, the only time I'm going to disagree it. with you tonight, yeah. Anna. I, I, <laughs> and I certainly don't disagree with the evolution of the characters with the story. Yeah. I don't like the idea that a class is a straitjacket. Um, but I find there is a there's a richness and a guidance to it and a structure yeah. which actually enhances the freedom. But we don't need to talk about our differences. Yeah. Let's move on. No, no. But yeah, I think it's <laughs> perfect. And and class are perfect when you want to introduce people to the game. Then it's perfect. Go classless and and even zero level game is for when you played for for some years and then you know what the game is about and stuff sure. like that. That's when you want to deep. It, I totally agree with you. The class definitely has a room, but not for everyone and not for every campaign. Sure, it's I just ironic that a such a classy lady wants classless. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. So 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 then I wanted to to figure out a way to to get the characters to learn because the the you want them up to that same level of abilities that you will have at level one, meaning how do you introduce? So uh, I basically took all the different features that a, a, a first level character can learn, meaning cantrips, first level spells, using armor, using weapons and stuff. And then I just plotted, plotted them down and say, okay, how do you go about learning that in the game, during the game, so to speak? And then I figured out a way of, <clears throat> of you, you basically, you, you roll to try and let's say I want to be a wizard. My I want my character to be a wizard. And then you have no idea. You never seen a spellcaster. You don't know, but you know there is something called magic and you you kind of figure it out. Then that will be a really difficult role. You have to make like a, a, a roll, a, basically a crit. You have to roll a, a DC 20. And, but you can try every day to do it. So there's like 5% chance every day that you will get a little bit on the part. So then I will say that you need like 10 successful roles in order to be able to cast that first spell meaning if you just your character just sit down every day and do it it will take on average like 100 or 150 days of, of of figuring out just to be able to learn that cantrip which seems kind of excessive but i think it's kind of realistic but then you can better the odds if mm -hmm. you've seen one cast magic all of a sudden you get like a plus two on the roll if you've been able to study carefully like someone is prepping spells and then cast it next to you, then you get like a plus four on the roll. If you have someone teaching you, <clears throat> then you will automatically succeed. Every day you get someone to teach you, you will automatically. So if you have a teacher 10 days and you cast that cantrip, you, you don't need to roll because the teacher will make sure that you succeed. And that, so the time and the, how difficulty and also the, the, someone teaching you that was basically the my premise for it so 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 i basically put that in and that goes for everything learning weapons armor or whatever so to speak so that that's the basic rules you just take the existing features and figure out the time it will roughly take someone to learn it from from zero and also you can put in the equipment in order to learn how to use a sword you need a sword or at least a mock-up of something that sure feels a little bit like rachel and i are used to this because we played a little bit of gurps for a while yeah, there and... You go. Yeah. oh yeah and GURPS yep. is very crunchy like that. Yeah, yep. mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, so I, w <laughs> I wanted to put that into to D and D, so to speak. That that will, but I love to keep how action economy works, how combat works, hit point works, armor sure. class, and all that, so to speak. Yeah. Well, I love that. And I have a couple of thoughts and comments, but I want to make sure the rest of the panel can can comment and uh, ask any questions. I do want to follow up on that because as a DM, just a couple of things that you said there, like there are so many story yeah, ideas yeah. and fun things that you could do with that mm -hmm. concept. Yeah. Um, you know, just the idea of this, you know, little lad or lass that wants to be a, a, a mage and, you know, they're trying to sneak in and peek through the window uh, and, and watch, you know, someone yep. in the town that they know practices magic and a whole adventure around how they try. You can just do fun stuff like that. Yep. But uh, rest of the panel, any thoughts or questions you'd like to ask? I mean, I love the concept. I love the idea yeah. of starting out unaware of everything and yet knowing that you want to be something. 
and trying to find in the world the tools and means to become that something. It's not just going to land on your doorstep. You're not just going to find a, a wizard hat and suddenly have access to magic. <laughs> y you have to go yeah. about doing it. Mm -hmm. And I really like that. It's almost like a survival aspect of things. You're having to, to go out of your way to to find power and might and and story in the world. Yeah. And yeah. it also expands I mean, the sweet oh sorry, go on. Kevin. Oh no, you go ahead and Yeah, I was gonna say it's it's it the sweet spot I've noticed in almost all editions. It varies a little bit, but it's from first level to usually about seven or eight, maybe ten, twelve at the most. After that game becomes difficult cumbersome takes Agreed. a long time so, Agreed. so 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 that means that by i wanted to extend the sweet spot in the other end meaning the low end so you can you can kind of move in so when you're first second level you already have 10 sessions done so you can prolong the sweet spot of the game by starting earlier so it's that's yeah. exactly why i want to do this i mean you 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 couldn't have said it any better there the the fear uh, the 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 when you got two hit points and you you, you know a rat could actually kill you not just mm -hmm. be a subquest yep. um, you know that's that's a meaningful time of the game and it adds so much to role play and I wanted to extend the sweet spot that's such a mm -hmm. good way to put it Anna John uh, John only says that because he doesn't want to hand out XP very often that's why it'll extend <laughs> those I'll, I'll have you know my my Greyhawk Awakening cast had their XP before I went to bed last night so. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, when you can prove me wrong in our campaigns, then I'll. Uh... Uh, Cameron, we look please, forward to you proving something. us wrong. <laughs> Go ahead, Cameron. Um. Oh, I was just gonna say. I think like, isn't that how regular life works? So often, it's like you might go out and set out to do something, and then you realize, oh, oh, well, I'm not very good at that, yeah. or um, <laughs> or I'm even better at this other thing, and like. You know, right now, the character that I'm working with for this upcoming campaign, I'm not quite sure what her class will be yet. And I'm kind of okay with leaving it a little bit nebulous. <laughs> There's a couple of routes that maybe she could take, but until I know her and until she interacts with the world, I don't know yet. Um, and so, like, I think that's what I like so much about, like, this kind of stripped down version of it lets you, like, be that character and like kind of have a more reactionary uh like life in this realm that you're in of like who do you bump into who helps shape you into you um you know what thousands of paths can you take that are you know spelled out before you in your one little starting town uh yeah. i think it's very exciting I agree 1000% with everything that has been said before me, and it was very eloquently put, so I'm going to say that too. I second it. Um, but I'm also really excited that we have, like, we know what age we're starting at, where we're starting. We, we have no idea how, which I'm very excited about, but the fact that I know that we get to work together to create all of these characters in these moments, and oh, I'm so excited about it. <laughs> Uh, and then we have no idea how we're going to end up. And it's just, we just will eventually. And or that's if incredibly we're gonna exciting. End up. <laughs> if we're going to end up too, that yep. is sure. So, so, so I, two things I want to say there. One, because uh, a couple of things Rachel said might not make sense to people in the chat. Uh, so we're starting in the free city of Altamira in the world of Aird. Uh, they will be starting as level zero characters. Uh, they're actually going to start as... Uh, sort of young teen or like immediately preteen, to like, like you know, 10, 11, maybe 12 years old at the most. Um, and they're going to essentially uh, be in some form or another by various means, uh, uh, urchins uh, starting out in this story. But each of them has a robust backstory and they can immerse themselves in the characters. And they have each pre-selected a class, uh, but I'm going to they're, they're not going to have any abilities in that class as they begin. They're going to be small children. Um, but I will give homage to what Anna has said here. I might even recuse or rescind my statement earlier that I disagree with the classless approach. I think that that actually does make a lot of sense. You could have a bent that you want to pursue. And maybe as Cameron said, you find out you like it and you're good at it. Or maybe through the story, you thought you were going to be this, but you're, you decide to be that. I mean, why would you not? I think that's a great flexibility to add. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the second thing is, I want to be clear, uh, as Rachel said, she is in college. So any rumor that she is in middle school is absolutely inaccurate. <laughs> it's all the pink. I want I'm to true. dispel that. 
she is in college all right we always so. want to be in middle school and we want to have that playfulness still in us so, that's yeah. exactly right dog yeah. i'm teasing i'm teasing you rachel uh, I robert thomas I'm 20 years old <laughs> so so the question i have is and i i don't know that i've if i've heard you answer this before um with regards to your the starting off at level zero and such and the how long they were did the people that you, uh, the people that uh your players did they know going in uh when they, when they were recruited for the game that this was going to be the case or yes i think not was, all okay. the players but i most of them did it's, i think i had one player at least that came in so late that barely had mm -hmm. chance to to be part of there, there were some play, players that came in after two or three sessions in the game while they were okay. zero level so but the ones that were initially in the campaign they knew about it and and we had like a session zero we had a couple of session zeros but because i gave them the history of the village everybody who knew there i gave them the map with every household and stuff who, who I mean there was like 50 people or so living in the village mm -hmm. i gave them the names the the, the little portrait and the backstory what they knew and then i we had a, a session zero where i pre presented all that to the initial players but then there were a couple of players who came in afterwards who only got uh, the very quick like okay you're here and boom <laughs> now we go yeah. so to speak so yeah and we're and we're what <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. so yeah. on that what was the reception from those players to doing level zero and and moving through level zero into potentially level one I think it was a, it was a mixed bag, so to speak, because some players like the the familiarity. They want to know, okay, I know this, I know where I'm going at, and and so on. They didn't don't want the uncertainty of okay, the fluid. I need to go around looking for my next ability and, and so on. It's like it should be there and and doing it. and and I think that also tells there is the way you look at rules is very different from DM from group to group from dm to dm and from play style to play style meaning in my game rules are scaffolding it's it's a necessary evil and it needs to be there otherwise it's just improv kind of theater so to speak it, it's there to to give rigidity and 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 move the story forward so to speak but but in some some players and some groups rules are essential they are the the big part a lot of players love the fact that i can look for a plus two sword instead of a plus one and have one more plus that's that's essential and i can totally understand that's a very valid way of playing DD. &D. it's not the way i normally play I've, I've had that period when that was all i wanted was to to have a bigger golf bag of cooler weapons and and, and stuff like that and and more pluses and stuff but i moved on from there and unfortunately i kind of demand for my players to to at least acknowledge that there are other features of the game than than pluses and minuses of things so to speak and especially in combat absolutely it's, yeah well said well said i mean you know, two ahead. of the three letters are role playing and then the last yeah. part is game not to say that the game is not why we come to the table to do it i always yeah. i always say that whenever i, I make the joke it's mostly a role playing yeah. but but, mm -hmm. yeah. but I think it's important that that you as a DM that you communicate your your preferences for how you want to play at, at your table, so to speak, and 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 its preferences is not dictates, so to speak, its preferences and what you emphasize on. So players can pick and choose a game that will reward their interest and their passions in the game because that's the cool thing with role-playing game it's not such a wide family and the hobby is so wide and there's so many different cool ways of playing that you can have different types of, of interest and passions fulfilled differently in different types of games and i think that's part of that's part of the fun originally it wasn't that way it was more rigid and this is the way to play and no other so to speak yeah. and 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 that means that even the, the way i played originally we played very old school very old school that one of the goals for the old school was to, for the dm to outwit the players meaning figure out cool things that yeah. now you put yourself in a dumb stuff and you didn't think about this so now your character is going to die and and that's a valid way it's like playing John chess in that. a way with more rules <laughs> no but, but, no 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 <laughs> i like simulations and simulations include <laughs> danger yeah mm. and, no, and it's, it's funny yeah oh, go, sorry good anna no i was gonna say that, that that's a valid way of playing it and and for a lot of players they want that nerve so to speak and losing characters i've evolved away from it in a lot of instances, but not fully but a lot of sense yes yeah uh so 
in the chat it was funny i, I mystical unicorn amanda uh she is un unmasked my virtue signaling you know i say that i like introducing new generations to the game and the style and she has correctly identified that i just have a whole new generation to traumatize uh, <laughs> he's um, not wrong but... <laughs> <laughs> No, Th uh, Th Thomas, your know. character, your character got to level twelve and never died. So See. quit whining. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely died. <laughs> no, Can, it was it was a technicality. Hundred percent died and then was brought back by literally a miracle of the of the thing. I was ready for him to just be dead. <laughs> He's only mostly dead. You can't take this from me. He died. <laughs> Uh, all right, that's uh, that's awesome, right? So, uh, Anna, back to the the uh, yeah. the level zero sort of mechanics. I think everything you said made a lot of sense. But you know, role playing game to Thomas's point, I think every part of the game can have role playing. I don't like it even with, for combat not to have role play. Combat should be role play. Um, sure. And anybody that wants, Jay starting, anyone that wants to hang on with us, we're going to go about 10 more minutes with Anna uh, because we did start a little bit late tonight and uh, we're having such a good time with her. Uh, but Jay and I have already ch chatted. You might have seen that earlier. Uh, he said, go ahead and it just we'll jump in five minutes uh, to his time would be seven. My time would be eight Eastern. And so if you want to hang with us for just a few more minutes, we'd, we'd love that. And then we'll raid straight into Jay. Um, when you When you do things like turnip farming let's come back to that example what does that actually look like at the table and you know i don't i mean i could role play some turnip farming but i don't know that i'm going to take up three hours role playing my turnip farming um I, I, there just could be some dice rolling around that i guess my you know my time of season my fertilization my water my what how do you how do you game that at the table the, one of the, the, I think we live in such hectic times. Uh, so, so meaning in fantasy world, going back to, to medieval times and stuff, time is a, a, a resource that DMs need to, to use more, so to speak. And, and with that, I mean, boredom is one of the things that you can torment your players with more than, than anything. Meaning people that come in and, and they want action and they want results and they want it right away. In order to get them, meaning, it's like a, a movie. Think about horror movies and, and thriller movies and, and big adventure blockbusters like Lord of the Rings and others. Like if it were all moving the story forward frame by frame, anyone who read Lord of the Rings book, the first 500 pages is just boring going through nothing <laughs> happening, so to speak. So, so you need to, to weed out the players who can't take it, meaning you need to yearn for the first combat. I mean, the, Frodo so, waited yeah. about like, Exactly. seven years yeah, before meaning, he left yeah, exactly so, so what i mean is that take an hour and describe that thing make some perception roles and and, and some some moving about telling things but sprinkle in some knowledge that be helpful down the line so so when i prep sessions like that i i put in like three four five things that they could discover if they're really lucky or smart or inquisitive and things that they should know and they need to know later so to speak a little bit of lore they could discover like in the initial sessions i had there were two mass graves outside of the village and and one and there was a the druid oak and under that was was the, the some she shield landers. First, there was the Halmarda the Cruel. He came in, and that's part of Greyhawk history in the shield. Mm -hmm. He came in and took this little village, or it was a town back then, killed off everybody. He was the guy that got the hand and the eye of Vecna, thought he was Vecna. Mm -hmm. He ruled oh. in Vecna's name in this era. So Wait, he came I thought in. Vecna was just a Stranger Things character. Exactly, but he's not. <laughs> no, no, he's, he's, th this is the, the original Greyhawk Vecna, so to speak. And he, he, Halmarda the Cruel found his hand and eye and like, 300 years ago, came in and 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 thought he was Vecna with 500 or a couple of hundred of his, his people. He was fleeing, trying to establish a, a realm. And then the, the, the knights of the, of the Holy Shielding, that was a young order back then, were hunting him. He came in and wanted to use that village to, to simply just a stopgap and fill up his bellies and, and stuff like that. So he came in, killed off everyone in the village, buried them in a mass grave outside the walls to scare off any shield landers who would come, put the heads on spikes and all that evil stuff and, and so on. And then when, when the, the people out tur turnip farming and stuff, they walked past that spot where that happened 300 years ago. So if they were perceptive, they could get the feeling. There was a, and then afterwards when the shield landers, after Vecna 
they they liberated the village, killed off Halmadar's men and 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 Halmadar himself. And what they did, then they buried and burned the Halmadar men, and there were fragments of the eye and the hand in that pile of stuff ah. of pyre and those are still i haven't told my players that they could have found that don't let them watch the screen yes <laughs> so, so yeah so so but now they've gone from the village now they go back there are there are small fragments of the high and the and hand so vecna's little bit of vecna's residue is buried out there in the fields they went they could have sensed it and and stuff and then that what that happened was after that, the Druid, because these people were old faithers, so so because these were the early days of the Shieldlanders, and the Shieldlanders had had failed them once, so they didn't trust it. So they, of course, got a village Druid who planted a tree to to sacred the area, and they started worship and tree. And that tree is standing there to this day, and it was it's a sacred tree. So if it burned down, it comes back up again the next day or in a few days. And the Iusian priest got so scared when they burned it up, and it came back again, and 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 so on. So they let it be, and 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 then the villagers go out secretly. Go and and bless to it and 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 kind of use it as a as a little gathering place because the Iusian priests are scared to say, well, that tree is magical because they are they are the not capable Iusian priests. They're like first third level or something like that. So so they don't want to mess with <clears throat> things that come back, so to speak. So I scared. love that, and yeah. I love and and that really sort of belies the fact that it's a, a boring turnip farming area when you have fragments of Vecna in a pile yeah. just a little while away. Yeah, so, so, so yeah. The, the history to learn, so to speak. And <clears throat> and if they spoke to some of the the oldest people that survived in villas they knew a little bit about this they've heard and, and yeah. so on so 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 you you need to you, you should be inquisitive and perceptive and do, do some you have that rules that Anna, do you and we only have about three minutes i got to make yeah. a couple announcements um and i want to give anyone a chance to ask some final questions of anna but for example any of those session zeros you're very detailed do you have an example that's documented that you would be willing to share with me where i could see how you um how sure. you sort of think and lay that I, out I, yeah, I have I have for my patrons and you're one of my patrons. I'm one of your it, patrons, yeah. Yeah. So so there, <laughs> is it, is there are the side, can I, I just put, download it? Yes. They, they okay. put together the history of the village and, and stuff like that. There will be more stuff coming, the full explanation of the village, all the, the people there and stuff. I just wanted my players to be gone from the village before I, I posted it to everybody. Perfect. So, all, so, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all right. All right. All right. I will I will definitely um oh yeah. yes, I'll take care of that, Manda. Before I log off tonight, I will take care of that. Uh all right, final questions for Anna. Or comments. Thank you for being so cool all the Thank time. Thank you You're so welcome. much for sharing. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. This is awesome fun to to babble because in my real life, no one understands what I'm doing. So that's why it's wonderful oh. to hang out with with people at conventions <laughs> or in Zoom and, and Twitch and, and stuff like this to, yeah. with people that understand what I'm doing. So yeah, so it's yeah. a lot of fun. So thank you well, so much for having me. You bet. And typically we do more, uh, you know, uh, chat in the stream, but with all the folks we have, I mean, uh, questions from the chat, but I really wanted to let the, uh, the panel here engage with you, Anna. Let me flip the script around before I close out. Yeah. Um, you've played this game for a long time uh, with these two young ladies that are they've both played uh, so they're not they're not neophytes but they're they're really really early in their D&D experience um, beyond sort of what we already covered in terms of taking your time and you know, building the character what advice would you give them about you know playing this game and, and developing a, a love for it that that lasts I think you should do both playing and DMing you you should you should both run your games and play games. I think both of them are equally important because it's that gives you an appreciation for the person that that does the game for you, so to speak, that run the game and do the prep. And you also get involved in the rule system and, and making judgment and stuff that is important. So I think a good player needs to be a DM and vice versa. So so I used to DM way more than I played, which made me worse in both roles. So now I'm I'm actually more doing both and that's that's really good. And then and then start thinking about what you want to create, so to speak, meaning specialize in something. You do rules, you do backstories, character portraits, magic cool things you want to be the fey expert or, or you want to dive into demons or whatever you want to be i, I want to do do dogs in the world or something dog <laughs> <is> many, <laughs> th there is so many cool things you can do and then share it with the with the greater community it, it's a lot of fun and a bravo what what great counsel i could not agree more uh so as we close out reminder we do have a stream on sunday at 1 30 that will be run by robert uh, Robert, do you have a title or theme you can share with the team? 
Uh, no, not yet, because it is going to be Greyhawk based. Um, it will be Castle and Crusades. I am still looking for at least two players. So great. Um, if you're interested, uh, you know, just hit me up. Anybody you know, in the chat, perfect. you can. You can uh, go to our Discord. Manda, Mystical Unicorn, has posted it several times. Uh, you can message Robert. He's Phantom NJ. And N is in New. Uh, J is in Jersey. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you can you can message him and uh, join his. You don't you don't have to have any prior experience. Robert is a really good at DM at just sort of bringing someone in off the cuff. Uh, then next Tuesday night we'll have our normal Greyhawk Awakening session. Uh, the party. Uh, is in dire straits. They are delving beneath the Temple of Hextor. Anna, we're doing uh, Gary Hoolian's Dragon Magazine Spine oh. Castle adventure. Mm -hmm. um, I have leveled it down because that was for much higher level characters, but it's still a, a very dangerous and fun adventure. And um, I believe last night when we concluded three of the party members, one involuntarily, and then the other two voluntarily diving in after him are down a 95 foot pit um, that has water, a cage, and a creature that they just saw at the end of the session last night, which is quite scary. Oh, uh, the that's other, terrifying. The, the other two players are up above, <laughs> and they're fighting a massive animated chain, which was what caused the first player to go in the, the pit involuntarily. So it's going to be a fun time next Tuesday night, and then we'll be right back here with LMA next Wednesday. I want to say thank you to all of our panel here. Um, I know with, with all of us and with Anna just giving us so much knowledge, there wasn't a lot of time for Q&A <laughs> everyone but great job thank you thomas and robert thank you especially to rachel and cameron for carving out time i cannot wait to play at the same table with the two of you so and excited. anna anna thank you so much for being with well, us tonight thank you thank this you. is awesome anna. fun so so yep so and i'll pop over to jay and and i'll see you people there again in a few minutes all right uh, we're raiding into jay in just a few seconds here and we'll give him a nice strong raid he's got a great group tonight hey, he's got eric mona with him uh it's going to be a lot of fun and raiding now all right and with and that said we're done yep.